Dynamite. Developed by the Swede Alfred Nobel, Dynamite could deliver a bigger bang in a smaller package and is what would give Whitehead's torpedoes their punch. This is one of Whitehead's torpedoes. It's small, it's old, and it's made of uh, brass and copper. And essentially it consists of a warhead. In the early torpedoes, it was really quite small, no more than 20 or 25 pounds. A device for setting it off, simply a percussion device. A cylinder full of air, which was its propulsion medium and then a simple reciprocating engine which used the compressed air to drive the counter-rotating propellers. The secret was how he got it to stay on depth. And it essentially had a very simple pressure switch which sensed water pressure and then controlled the vertical rudders here. So it would stay on depth to within a few feet, certainly close enough to the intended depth that it would strike the most vulnerable part of the ship. Whitehead's invention was a success. In the 19th century, most navies bought into it. But torpedoes would have to wait until World War I before being used wholesale in combat. One engagement in September 1914 was to demonstrate the torpedo's potential beyond any doubt and go down as one of the blackest days in the history of Britain's Royal Navy. Early on the morning of September 22nd, German U-boat commander Otto Wettingen spotted three slow-moving Royal Navy ships. Not quite believing his luck, he closed for the attack. Launching a single torpedo at the middle ship, Wettingen ordered his boat, U-9, to periscope depth to watch the drama unfold. The torpedo ran straight and true, slammed into the hull of the ship, and exploded in a massive fountain of water. The two remaining ships rushed to help pick up the survivors. Sensing further opportunity, Vettigan attacked and sank them also. In the space of less than an hour, the Royal Navy had lost three ships, 62 officers, and 1,397 ratings the worst losses ever suffered in British waters. This disaster convinces the Royal Navy they must take submarines seriously. But having a potentially devastating weapons system at your disposal is nothing, unless you know how to use it. When in battle, the submarine skipper has a choice about the best way to use his torpedoes against the enemy. Hitting the side of a surface ship will probably sink it. Detonating underneath will certainly break its back, uh, make it impossible to tow home, to repair, uh, and will almost certainly sink it. If you imagine that my hands together like this, or my arms, are the hull of a ship, as the torpedo passes underneath it and explodes, you'll get certainly the shock lifting the ship, and then you get this large bubble formed of all the explosive gases, and then the ship falls back into the bubble and breaks in two. And given that most ships are moving targets, aiming the torpedoes is crucial. Right four runners, right four runners. Just like you do when you're hunting and you're trying to maybe uh, shoot a bird, is you have to not only see where the bird's at, but to predict where that bird is going and then to lead the shot. And the same thing you have to do with the torpedo, because the torpedo is relatively slow. It's not like a rifle shot. It's going out there and you have to predict where that boat's going to be in the future to accurately place a weapon on that target. Get the predictions right, and the enemy won't know what's hit them. Well, you don't know we're there until the explosion rips the hull right out from underneath. Despite advances in torpedo propulsion and guidance during the 1920s and 30s, by the dawn of World War II, torpedoes were by no means perfect. For the first half of the 20th century, torpedoes are the most complicated weapons invented. During the early stages of the Second World War, both the German and American navies have trouble with their torpedoes. The one malfunction every submariner feared was the circular running torpedo. Also, these did not always run hot, straight, and true, which tragically sank Commando Kane's ship, the Tang, within 20 seconds of the torpedo being fired, the last one they were firing in that enemy ship, it circled around and struck the side of our own ship. 
The problems were eventually ironed out, and American torpedoes went on to ravage the Japanese Navy in World War II. With the arrival of the Cold War, combat at sea changed. Subs would need to attack not only surface ships, but other subs as well. Gyroscope-guided torpedoes were not going to be accurate enough. Initially developed by German scientists in World War II, wire guidance allows the pilot of a fighter or attack helicopter to guide an airborne missile to its target. Adapted for use under the sea, next-generation torpedoes would be electronically guided in real time by a long wire attached from the torpedo to the sub. Now, submarines could hit any moving target above or below the sea. The wire, which might be several tens of kilometers long, uh, runs from the electronics in the torpedo into the fire control system of the submarine so that it can tell you what it is doing. So you can tell the torpedo to go left, go right, go and search over here, and the torpedo can then come back and say, well, I found something, is this the target? You then have the ability to say yay or nay. Today's most advanced torpedoes have a wireless option. Mark 48 ADCAP torpedoes can be fired without a wire and home in on the target by themselves. Since the end of World War II, only a handful of torpedoes have been fired in anger at the enemy. The most recent was by HMS Conqueror when she attacked the Argentine cruiser General Belgrano during the Falklands War in 1982. Jaunty Powis was the navigation officer on board Conqueror on the day of the attack. Now the Belgrano was the ex-USS Phoenix, which had actually survived the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941. And she was, as you might imagine, large, armored, um, with a great deal of watertight subdivision. And we then fell into a brief discussion. What would we fire against such a ship? Conqueror was equipped with both the tried and tested 800-pound World War II Mark 8s and lighter weight wire-guided torpedoes. Given the size and strength of the target, there was only one viable option. The Mark 8 torpedo has an 800-pound warhead and firing against an old but armored ship with a lot of watertight subdivision, you wanted to make big holes in it. And so this was the obvious torpedo to fire, which is appropriate really because uh, there was a World War II ship attacked by World War II torpedoes fired by a Cold War submarine. Having shattered her overnight and got permission to fire, we closed to what was actually an ideal firing position at a range of probably around 1,400 yards, which is rather less than a mile. And we fired three of these torpedoes, of which two hit. For the first 45 years of the 20th century, torpedoes had proved their worth time and again. But with the dawn of the Cold War, they would be overshadowed by a new generation of weapons with unimaginable destructive power. That weapon is so powerful, it makes them think twice before taking any type of aggressive action. In World War II, the Gato-class submarine not only had torpedoes as a major potent weapon, but they also had deck guns, which significantly crippled the Japanese fleet, especially later on in the war. You think, oh, what you want to do is hit the bridge section. 41 hit midship on this small trawler to take out the engine room. Actually, no. If there are any other guns on that trailer, the first thing the guys wanted to do on the submarine is take out the other gun. It was sort of anti-battery fire one shot to each, each other. Uh, bursting was nice because it would cover a large deck area at once, and you could take out the deck gun crew on the opposite side.